To the left hand side for Vieira, who will play through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel Keller and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. The Daily Arsenal Podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Happy Sunday. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of a Guna, the Arsenal podcast with me, your host, Harry Simu. Hope everybody's had a great weekend so far. Plenty of it still to go. Get outside, enjoy the sunshine. It is a lovely day here in North London today. Really looking forward to wrapping up uh, all my work today. Uh, I say this morning, well, it's afternoon now, uh, looking forward to wrapping everything up so that I can go outside and spend uh, some time out there and take in that vitamin D that we all so desperately need. Uh, I hope everybody's good. Um, let me say a few hellos because there's plenty of you in the live chat with me already. Big hello to uh, Big GZ. We've got Afsar. Um, I beg your pardon, got to the mute button in time there to sneeze because hay fever is killing me at the moment. Uh, big hello to Christoph. We've got Hacker. We've got the uh, Swedish Guna. We've got Tom and uh, we've got James who says, uh, I'm still laughing at your story about the grocery store from yesterday's show, Comedy Gold. <laughs> Check that one out if you haven't done so already. I had, a, I think it was a good five minute rant on the state of supermarkets here in the UK and the fact that despite introducing new technology, it is still a massive pain in the backside to go and do like a family food shop. So uh, yeah, I had a little bit of a moan about that. Uh, quick reminder, if you haven't done so already, make sure you leave a like on the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're new, if you're not new and you're here regularly, you know exactly what you're going to get. So why not leave the like uh, on the uh, video nice and early and subscribe? Uh, of course, if you haven't done so already. Reviews on audio platforms are very, very helpful too. We've got some targets to get to both on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts in particular. Okay, so what we're going to do on today's show, well, we've got a few things to touch on. We're going to react to last night's UEFA Champions League final. Real Madrid making it number 15. Incredible stuff. Um, they are going to go down in history. And I, I find it very difficult to believe that in my lifetime, another team is going to get to the number that Real Madrid are at in terms of those European Cups. So well done to them. We'll talk about their inevitability. We'll talk about how the game went. We'll also talk about Carlo Ancelotti because I shared an opinion about him on social media last night on X or Twitter, as it was formerly known. And there was a fair few people that disagreed with me. So I'd like to get your take on that. Uh, we're also going to talk Jakub Kivior. Could he be on his way back to Italian football this summer? We're going to discuss the Arsenal defender, the Arsenal, not the Arsenal defender, the Barcelona defender that Arsenal are being linked with. We're going to talk about a potential destination for Emil Smith-Rowe. And we're going to talk following Balogun after a statistic around his season was brought to my attention earlier on today. And that sparked a bit of a debate and a bit of a conversation about him. Lots and lots to get into on this episode of the Chronicles of a Guna. Before we talk anything football related, though, I do want to make sure that I send my best wishes out to um, somebody that I'm very fortunate to call a friend. Um, I, I met this person, uh, of course, when um, I first kind of got into the podcasting game, if you like, and and this person in particular helped me loads um, on my journey, was always there to provide me with advice, would pick up the phone every now and again when he knew that I was going uh, through some difficult moments or, or struggling a little bit. Um, so I want to send all my love to Kevin Campbell. Um, we know that he's not too well at the minute. Um, as has been going around on social media, I'm not going to go into uh, the details or or speculate on the details because I don't think that's fair. Um, I think Kevin and, and his family obviously need privacy at the moment, but they also need all the love and support in the world. So um, I do want to send my best wishes to 
a legend, not just on the pitch, but off of it as well. Because as I say, I, I, this gets me when I talk about it because Kevin Campbell has been an incredible friend to me. And it's mad because like when you start off podcasting or, or doing what I did and sort of changing careers, you look at these players that you kind of grew up on and you think, you know, these guys are gods. These guys are out of my reach. These guys are um, above me, if you like. Not Kevin. Um, and that's no slight on his status as a footballer. That's because he is an incredibly down to earth and friendly, humble, um, and just all round amazing person. And um, I'm really upset about this. And uh, I just wanted to send my love. Um, and I'm sure you guys will all join me in that to uh, the former Arsenal striker, Kevin Campbell, who unfortunately isn't too well at the minute. Lots of messages of support uh, from you guys in the chat as well um, to the brilliant super Kevin Campbell. Um, that's the word I was looking for. That word that CB has put in there. Genuine this is the best way to describe him. Um, just genuine all round. Good guy. OK, look, let's do uh, the UEFA Champions League final to kick off. Uh, Carlo Ancelotti uh, managing Real Madrid to number 15 in terms of uh, UEFA Champions League slash European Cup titles. And it's his fifth as a manager. What an incredible achievement that is. Um, there's an e inevitability about Real Madrid in this competition. They always seem to turn up when it matters. They don't always play that well. And I think that was true of last night's performance and last night's game. But they managed to get over the line. And you just, you watch that first half. And as impressive as Dortmund were and as impressed as I was personally with with the way that they'd come out there, I thought got their game plan spot on in terms of sitting back when they needed to, but also making sure that they broke lines really quickly and efficiently when the opportunity was there. And then looking to use the pace of Jaden Sancho on the right, but more so Adeyemi on the left-hand side to try and cause Real Madrid problems. And had things fallen their way, had things gone a little bit differently, that final could have gone very, very differently. But when you got to the second half and Dortmund's level, in my opinion, just dropped a little bit. Um, Real Madrid felt like they were starting to get a bit of a foothold and a bit of a grip on the game without being very good. Like it wasn't, oh my God, look at Real Madrid in the second half. They're completely different. I still don't think they were that good after half time. But you felt like they looked a little bit more stable and you also felt like um, you also felt like by uh, Bayern, I was going to call them Bayern for God's sake, Borussia Dortmund, they won't like me saying that, had just chopped off a little bit in terms of what they were able to produce and in terms of the threat that they posed. And then on 74 minutes, Real Madrid turned up, um, Carver Yao getting across the front post. He'd done that a few minutes earlier where he got across that near post and his header ended up landing on the roof of the net. That should have been the warning sign for Borussia Dortmund, despite curbling goal, making some unbelievable saves in that second half. Real Madrid did manage two goals in the end. Uh, Carvajal with the first and then Vinicius Junior with the second. And even that, I mean, look, I never want to put Real Madrid's successes in this competition down to luck, but my God, they've got a fair bit of it, haven't they, in this competition? Because... Vinicius Jr.'s finish, it wasn't even a good finish. Like, he could have that chance a 100 times. And on 99 of those occasions, he's going to strike the ball a lot cleaner than he did. He seems to kick it into the ground and that just catches Kerbal out and the ball ends up in the back of the net. Um, a decent watch. Wembley looked magnificent. The atmosphere looked magnificent. Um, I knew a few weeks ago that I wasn't going to be working on this year's UEFA Champions League final that I wasn't going to be attending. And I was OK with it, weirdly. You know, stadium I've been to loads um, between two clubs that I don't really have any affiliation to. I was fine with it. You know, I was fine with not going until yesterday. And I woke up in the morning and I started seeing the videos of uh, the Dortmund fans descending upon London, the Real Madrid fans gathering around Wembley and all the rest of it. And I started to think, oh, I wish I was there. And by the time kickoff came around, I was gutted um, that I was sitting watching it from my sofa. But yeah, congratulations to Real Madrid. And the take that I wanted to put to you guys on Carlo Ancelotti is this. Just looking at those scenes for those of you that are watching us on YouTube. 
to me, Carlo Ancelotti, by winning his fifth UEFA Champions League title last night, goes down as the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And I know a lot of people would disagree with that because I kind of got that impression from some of the replies I had on social media. I know a lot of people look at him and think, not quite, you know, and people will put Pep Guardiola above him and some will put Sir Alex Ferguson above him and, and various other names get thrown into that equation. But for me, Carlo Ancelotti um, established himself last night as the GOAT. Now, he was up there anyway in terms of the conversation. But I just, I, I think about it this way, right? To win five UEFA Champions Leagues and to win the English Premier League, the Italian Serie A, the French Liga, the Spanish La Liga, and the German Bundesliga, to have won all of Europe's top five leagues as a coach and five UEFA Champions Leagues. I don't know that it gets better than that. I know people will look at Pep Guardiola and they'll say, well, he's won um, in Germany and he's won in Spain and he's won in England, which is three of them. And because of how many titles he won in those countries, maybe that puts him above. But I would rather have Carlo Ancelotti's CV in that. He's gone and done it in all of the big five leagues. Maybe Pep Guardiola will do it by the time he retires. But right now, given the number of Champions League successes and what I've just mentioned, Carlo Ancelotti, to me, is the GOAT. Looking at uh, some of you guys' comments in the live chat on this, uh, just going back to um, the, the final last night, Zamoud says Dortmund choked at the end. I think that's a little bit harsh. I wouldn't say that they choked. I just think that Real Madrid are this inevitable force that we talk about them being so often. And in the end, you know, they had a little bit of the rub of the green staying in the game um, when they weren't playing very well. And if that happens, if they do get through, um, you know, those sometimes difficult stages in matches, you know, they've got difference makers. You know, they've got players that can be decisive. Was Danny Carvajal someone that I thought was going to be that? No, but obviously he's an incredibly decorated player. Um, I think that's six UEFA Champions Leagues for Danny Carvajal. It's, it's just unbelievable. Um, a team steeped in history, steeped in tradition and steeped in pedigree. Uh, Big G says um, Dortmund subs came across uh, as if the towel was thrown in. Good game anyhow. That's the, that's the thing, though, with Real Madrid, because they are so inevitable, because we all know what they are. And we know how capable they are of, um, you know, coming through those difficult situations. The minute you dominate a game, but don't get yourself in front, the doubt probably starts to creep in. And once they get their noses in front, in the way that they did through Carvajal last night, you just think, what's the point? It's done. You know, we talk about that inevitability. There's an inevitability about Real Madrid in terms of they'll go up the other end and score if you don't. But also defensively, they're pretty solid and pretty good um, as well when it really, really matters. So, yeah, maybe there was an element of that to it. MM says Real Madrid is a team that is inevitable in any European final. Swedish Gunnar says you have to convert your chances against them. Absolutely. Russ Morgan says Champions League equals Farmers League. There's a few um, there's a few comments about about sort of the refereeing performance last night, which I thought on the whole was pretty good. I, I don't have too many major complaints about that, but there was the Vinicius Junior thing. He was on a yellow card. Um, and then he, of course, clearly dived and Schlotterbeck had a little bit of a go at the referee, got himself in the book for his complaint. And it was clearly a dive. The, the defender, I think it was Matt Hummels that made the initial challenge, was just nowhere near Vinicius Junior, really. Um, so I understand why people were annoyed and and maybe even a little bit frustrated by that. Um, but yeah, it's it's just one of those things. Like, did it have a massive bearing on how the game ended in the end? No, it didn't. Um, we weren't talking about uh, VAR again. We, we saw Dortmund think that they got the ball in the back of the net legally, of course, at, right at the end of the game. And you thought maybe game on here at 2-1. But the, the speed with which that offside was checked and dealt with was very, very good. Very, very encouraging. Um, Vinicius Jr. maybe on another night could have found himself being shown a second yellow card. But I don't think he really deserved one for the first challenge that he got a yellow card for. He did close the goalkeeper down. He was a little bit late in his challenge. There wasn't really that much in the contact between them. And I thought he was a little bit unlucky to get booked for that. So maybe it was just the universe balancing it all out. Um, 
just on my Ancelotti take, Hacker says, uh, no opinion on Ancelotti. Uh, they're all good, in my opinion, unless you're Lampard or something. Uh, Zamud says, Pep and Fergie managed always the best teams in their country. But Ancelotti doesn't mind challenges. He's managed Napoli and Everton. Uh, Core Gamer Zone says he has no treble. I don't know that that's what I'd judge him on. Troy says, um, I totally agree, but most Arsenal fans would say, what did he do for Everton when we asked uh, for him when we were finishing in eighth? Uh, Big G says, top tactical manager who's never staled. Uh, Afsar says, Pep is the GOAT. Ronaldo says uh, Ancelotti influence in the way the game is played is quite irrelevant. Guardiola changed the game. This is crystal clear. Um, and Brian says Ancelotti clearly knew what he was doing when he rejected Odegaard. Look, I think this thing about styles, like we talk about football being coached to the nth degree these days and that instructions are so specific that we've lost a little bit of the individuality um, that we used to really love and adore when watching football. And I certainly think that that's true and, and certainly believe that football was probably a better place when we had these mavericks and the characters and, you know, individual brilliance was more of a thing than system uh, systems and systematic brilliance, although obviously that is good too. I just think with Ancelotti, I just love that he's a throwback. I just love that he is someone who is what I grew up believing football was all about. And look, I'm not taking anything away from Pep or any other manager that is very specific in his systems. And there are some incredibly successful managers in the game having approached things that way. I just think that like a great example of this is like somebody asked me about, you know, his formation. And it's like right now at Real Madrid, and obviously we know that Kylian Mbappe is, is probably going to come in through the door soon you look at that squad and you think no real centre forward option. Hosselu is there, but is he good enough? No, not really. Not to start week in, week out for Real Madrid. And so what have they done? Carlo Ancelotti hasn't gone, well, this is my system. It's my way or the highway. This is the only way I'm going to play. So tough. And, you know, shoehorn people into positions that just don't work for them. He's spoken a lot this week in the build up to the final about being adaptable and about finding different solutions to suit his players. And that's what he's done because Vinicius and Rodrigo start in wide areas, but they come in infield and they come together like a front two when Real Madrid are on the attack and in possession, which I think is it is really, really effective for them. When Kylian Mbappe comes, does that change? Probably. But right now, that's what they've got. And that's um, and that's the way that they are doing things. But congratulations to Real Madrid, the 15 time European champions. OK, uh, next up, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, Jakob Kivio, the Arsenal man who uh, joined the club, of course, not that long ago, but is already being linked with a move away from Arsenal Football Club. According uh, to the latest reports, AC Milan have made Jakob Kivio their priority for this summer. Milan were unsuccessful in attempts to sign the player last January, but are determined to return uh, to the charge in the coming weeks. Now, Jakob Kivio was always a target for Milan. I can remember him being spoken about as a potential Milan player when he was at Spezia. And obviously, Arsenal were the ones that were able to get this deal done and get the player in the door. If I look at Jakob Kivio's contribution since arriving at Arsenal, obviously found it quite difficult to establish himself as a first team regular. He's a regular in the sense of he's always part of the squad. He comes on in a lot of games um, when we need to shore things up, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But you look at sort of his statistics for the season that's just ended, 20 Premier League appearances. So there were 18 Premier League games in which he didn't feature at all. He was in the starting 11 29% of the time. He had a good run in the team. And I'll just tell you exactly when that was. He had a good run in the team between the end of December and the end of March, where he featured in 10 Premier League games consistently, started a fair few of them, came on as a sub in the couple um, in eight of the. So in eight of them, he started um, and in two of them, he came on as a substitute. So he had a good old run then. And then he found himself kind of in and out of the team again uh, between that point at the end of March and the end of the season. 
In terms of overall minutes, then, how many minutes has Jakub Kivior played in the Premier League this season? Just the 940. And he's played predominantly as a left-back for Arsenal. He played 13 games at left-back for Arsenal last season. Just the three at centre-back, um, which is what you'd say is his preferred position. And on that basis, I just think he's going to find it really, really difficult to to establish himself as a centre-back at Arsenal, which is ultimately what he wants to be, right? I know our left-back situation is a little bit strange because you look at the alternative options. Zinchenko, is he really a left-back? Most people would say no. Is Jurian Timber, who many felt would play uh, ahead of Jakub Kivio during that period of time, had he been fit? Is he a left-back? No, he's a right-back slash centre-back that can play more so a centre-back, in fact. He's a centre-back slash right-back slash left-back. Tommy Asu, who, again, is preferred a lot of the time to Kivio at left back, you wouldn't say he's a left back naturally either. And obviously you move into the center of our defense and of course we need backup and of course we need cover, but we have got the most formidable partnership in European football for me at center back. So where is this guy going to get a look in? I listened in to uh, Tom Canton's The Guna Talk earlier today, um, which you should check out by the way, brilliant show Daily um, episodes give you all the latest Arsenal news. I always watch it first thing in the morning to give me um, a, a sort of base of what the day uh, looks like in terms of the latest news, which is is brilliant. And one of the things that Tom was talking about was Arsenal's potential maybe to make some profit on Jakub Kivio. Now, we paid just under 20 million euros for Jakub Kivio to sign him from Spezia over in Serie A back in January 2023, so at the start of last year. Could we potentially make more than that now? I think we might. I think we could maybe get 20 to 22 to 23 million euros for Jakob Kivior, but I don't expect that we'd get much more than that. And, and the reason for that is when you are a bit part player, your value is badly damaged and affected by that. Jakob Kivior has been at Arsenal for a season and a half now and he's yet to establish himself as a first team starter. Been a good squad player, been in and out of the side, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And he's obviously part of a squad that has competed very, very well. But then you also have to factor in who is coming for him. And if we're talking about AC Milan, who are going through some changes right now, um, but it's insisted that that is not having any impact on this, that Kivior is still someone they want you got to factor in what they can pay, what a club um, from Serie A can pay. And to to think that Milan are going to cough up 30 million euros or whatever so that we do make some sort of profit on Jakob Kivior, which would obviously tempt you into selling him in comparison to maybe just getting your money back. I don't think that's very likely. You know, I really don't. I think that Jakob Kivior, um, if he does go to AC Milan on a permanent deal, is going to go for slightly more, if at all, than what we paid for him. Um, but no more than that. We're not going to make a mega profit on this player, which is why I'm on the fence about selling him. Um, just having a look uh, about, uh, sorry, I'm just having a look at some of you guys' comments um, on him. Uh, Ross says, we don't have to sell Kivior and Milan won't give us much more money for him than we paid. I should have just read that comment and saved myself the time of trying to explain. Um, what else have we got in the chat? Um, Zamud says, if Arsenal, uh, sorry, if AC Milan could pay a lot of money, then Arsenal should sell to them. Trader IQ, aka Mike Smith, says, I see no benefit to Arsenal letting him go. Um, he now knows the system is competent and is back up for Gabriel, even though we hope we don't need it. Yeah, I agree. Unless you're going to get a profit, unless you're going to turn a decent profit, there's no point, is there, really? Uh, big hello to the blessed one who joins us from Minnesota in the USA. Hope you're well, my friend. Uh, Jid says, Kivio's a great cover player in the left back and left centre back positions. Selling him would not make sense. Not everyone is meant to establish themselves as a first team starter, Harry. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like not everyone's going to be in the starting 11 week in, week out. But the point I'm trying to make is that because he hasn't established himself as one of the starters, it means that he's by no means in the untouchable category in terms of players that you wouldn't, wouldn't sell. Like I don't put him in the, the same position as a Gabriel or a Saliba or a Saka or as an Odegaard or, a, uh, you know, a, a Mar um, uh, I beg your pardon, you know, any other player, basically, that I deem untouchable. He's not untouchable. 
if the right offer comes, then I would consider it. For example, if Milan offered, let's say, £30 million, which would be nearly double what we've paid if you convert the euros into pounds, I would consider that because you'd have brought him in. He isn't uh, an indispensable member of the squad, yet you can double your money on him. And we keep talking about Arsenal not being very good sellers and that being an issue for a long, long time. Sometimes, guys, you just have to recognise when an offer is too good. You have to look at a player and you have to try and guess and predict, and it's not always easy to do, whether that player is going to go on to a better level, whether that is the player's peak level and they're going to stay there. And then you decide whether the money on offer is worth you parting ways with that player. Also, as well, the bit that people never talk about is what's best for Jakob Kivio, what works for Jakob Kivio. To turn down the opportunity to play as a regular starter at a club like AC Milan, it won't be easy, you know, um, especially someone who has that affiliation to Italian football, just like he does his footballing careers um, developed there. And it's what ultimately got him a move uh, to the Premier League with Arsenal. But yeah, Milan are circling around Jakob Kivio. Will that develop into anything further? We'll have to wait and see. But obviously, um, that interest in him is there. OK, uh, short pause. But before I take that very, very short pause and we talk about the defender that Arsenal are being linked with, who currently plays for Barcelona, uh, we're going to talk following Balogun very, very briefly as well. And we're going to talk about the London club that are in, apparently, for Emil Smith-Rowe. We'll also talk about what we should be asking for the Gunners man. I can see that there are only 75 likes on the board. And guess what? There are over 400 of you with me live right now across the multiple platforms. There's no reason why we shouldn't have a couple of hundred likes on the board. So please do that for me. It really, really does help. If you're listening on audio, leave us a review on whichever platform it is. That really, really does help. And subscribe uh, on whatever platform it is that you like to take in the podcast. Okay, um, let's take that pause. And when we come back, we're going to turn our attentions to this defender that Arsenal are said to be looking at. Who is he? What do we know about him? We'll get into that right after this. Okay, so we've been focusing, I think, a lot over the last few days on um, attacking options uh, for Arsenal because, of course, um, that's where the excitement is, right? And I think a lot of us look at that defensive unit and think as long as no one major leaves, we're, we're looking quite healthy there. But we did hear reports uh, last week that Arsenal are in the market for a defender this summer. The question is, is it someone that they're looking at to come in straight away or could they be looking at a potential project signing? Well, it looks like that is what they are doing here uh, with this young man. Uh, he goes by the name of Mikhail Fai. Uh, he's a Barcelona defender, 19 year old. Um, said to have a really big future at the club, so much so that despite not playing a senior game for Barcelona yet, his sale is expected to raise £17 million pounds or more. Uh, it's understood that there are a number of clubs looking at him. Look, if I sat here and told you that I know all the ins and outs about Mikael Fay, I'd be lying. I don't think there are many people outside of Barcelona circles that know an awful lot about this young man, but those in the scouting departments at some of Europe's biggest clubs are keeping a keen eye on this young man. Could he be an Arsenal player? This has been reported by Simon Jones of the Mail. Again, look, don't know anything about him to be able to say good move, bad move. But what I will say is it does fall in line with what we've been hearing recently, which is that Arsenal are looking to sign some younger talents with a view to future-proofing this very, very strong squad that we have at the moment. OK, um, let's talk following Balogun. What of him? Why is he on today's agenda? OK, so the reason following Balogun is on my agenda today is because uh, a stat was going around a little bit earlier on, put out there by the brilliant Orbino, who highlighted that this season, uh, or the season that's just ended, following Balogun only scored seven goals in 29 appearances for Monaco in League Earn. And he completed 90 minutes on just five occasions. And the reason I raise this, right, is because we constantly, every summer, we have this massive debate around why Arsenal are so bad at selling, blah, 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 blah. We hear it all the time. And the truth is that 
part of being a good seller is about recognizing when somebody's stock is high and so high that it probably isn't going to get any higher. It's not just about trying to pick out or identify someone at their point of strength. It's about when they're at their point of strength, trying to figure out whether or not you think that they have any more in them. And with following Balogun, it used to drive me mad. So many Arsenal fans were adamant that we should be keeping him. We're adamant that we should be building around him. We're adamant that he was much further down the progression line than Eddie and Ketia. And when that 30 million uh, euro offer came in from Monaco, I remember people saying, don't take it. It's not enough. Should be looking at 40, 50 million euros. And it was based on such a small sample size in terms of the evidence. He'd never done it at Arsenal. Obviously, he'd gone and had a loan spell in France in which he was pretty good. Um, but, you know, it was only one season really to go by. And I remember at the time saying that's a really good deal. And it reminded me a little bit of the whole situation that we had with Joe Willock, where people were going, no, 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 don't sell Joe Willock to Newcastle. 30 million is not enough. Keep a hold of him. But actually, when you keep a hold of these players and then they don't play, you are tanking their value. So you have to recognize that if Fuller and Balogun was on the market that summer at a point where he'd just come back from a loan spell in France where he'd done really, really well, it wasn't going to get any better for him. Because if he'd come in at Arsenal, he'd have been a bit part player, not played very much, and we'd all be talking about him in the same bracket as Eddie and Ketia now. But we're not. We weren't at the time. We were talking about a striker that had gone to one of Europe's top five leagues and done pretty well. And so 30 million euros was a reasonable offer from Monaco. We took it. And actually, you look at it now and you think, bloody hell, that was a really, really good bit of business. We're going to have to think that way with the player that we're going to talk about next as well, Emile Smith-Rowe. And we'll come on to that in a minute. But I just think that there's always this resistance from Arsenal fans because what happens sometimes is that we, we look at a player and we see a bit of promise and a bit of potential and we just assume that they're going to make it. We just assume that they're going to hit the levels that we hope for them. And that often isn't the case. And then even when they're not doing it and even when it's clear that the team's moved past them and that there are better alternative options, we go massive on like fighting their corner. And we did it so much with Balogun and, and Jid points this out in the chat. He says fans hated Enketia so much that they tried to pop up, prop up Balogun. That's what we've always done. Remember when fans hated Xhaka, so they claim Maitland-Niles was better and deserved to start ahead of him. You're right. I don't know that everybody hated them. I don't. I think hate's a strong word, but th the point is is valid in that people make their mind up about someone, and when they're so desperate to be proved right, they start making all sorts of ridiculous claims, like Maitland-Niles was better than Xhaka, like Balogun was miles clear of Eddie and Ketia. And look, Enketi has regressed in the second half of last season. He's not played a lot. So how was he supposed to continue um, building and developing? But Eddie Enketi has had far more of a look in with the Arsenal first team over the last three years than following Balogun ever got and was ever going to get. So, yeah, um, I think there is some validity in that point uh, that you make there, Jid. And 30 million euros that we got for a player who's only managed seven goals in the league. Um, and, and barely completed 90 minutes feels like a really, really good bit of business and is a sign that Arsenal are maybe getting a little bit better in that department. OK, uh, we're going to move on to our final and headline story concerning Arsenal's Emile smith Row. I think a lot of us believe that there's a, a real possibility that Emile smith Row's Arsenal career will come to an end um, at the end of this summer or at some point this summer. And the reason for that is just simply because he's fallen out of favour. OK, injuries have been a problem, we know, but he's not been able to re-establish himself as one of the key members of Mikel Arteta's squad. And when you look at how little football he's played, you can't imagine that he'll be satisfied. You can't imagine that he'll be happy. People will say he's got age on his side He's 23 years old. I really believe that at 23 years old, if you're good enough, and we know Emil Smith-Rowe is, you should be playing. Okay, he participated in 10% of our total minutes in the Premier League last season. He was in the starting 11, just 8% of the time. Didn't even manage 400 minutes in the Premier League, Emil Smith-Rowe. So, look, he can't be happy, but Arsenal obviously have to be happy with 
any offer that comes across the table if they're going to let him go. A lot of things have to fall into place for this to happen. Now, it appears that a fellow London club are interested in Emil Smith-Rowe and that that London club is Fulham. Fulham uh, have essentially, uh, or, or Fulham have apparently made Emil Smith-Rowe a transfer priority this summer and are ready to submit a bid for the Arsenal midfield player. Now, how much is a good offer for Emil Smith-Rowe? I know I'm going to get a lot of stick for saying this, but to me, if we get £25 million, we've done really, really well. Because it goes back to the conversations we were having earlier about people's stock and about um, knowing when to cash in on someone. And look, in Emil Smith-Rowe's case, it's a little bit different because I don't think there's ever been any question marks around whether or not he's got the talent to succeed at Arsenal. But you factor in all the injury problems he's had, the number of games that he's missed as a result of that, and the fact that he's found it really, really hard to re-establish himself as a key member of the group, despite putting those injury problems for the most part behind him. You kind of have to start to be realistic about the situation. I think for him, it's best that he moves on because he needs to play football regularly and at Premier League level. He needs to re-establish sort of his reputation, I think, because it has taken a bit of a kick. And again, when it comes to injury, it's through no fault of his own. But that's just where we are on Emil Smith-Rowe. A few years ago, was being talked about one of England's brightest young talents. And he's been left behind in that because, again, I go back to the point, just doesn't play and hasn't played enough football over the last few years. 25 million, for me, would be a really reasonable amount of money for Emil Smith-Rowe. And I think that if someone was to make an offer totaling that in whatever way that money is sort of, or that offer is cobbled together, I think we have to seriously consider it. And Fulham feels like a good landing spot for him. Decent side, probably not going to be in any trouble in terms of uh, the relegation fight. London doesn't have to move too far. Marco Silva, I think, is a really, really good coach. And we've seen players in kind of Emile smith Rose favoured position in that sort of hole in behind, really thrive at Fulham. Um, under Marco Silva, I think about Andreas Pereira. I think about how effective Wilson can be at times playing from those wide areas that Emil Smith-Rowe made his name at, um, you know, in his early Arsenal career. I just, yeah, for me, Fulham feels like a good move for him. Um, and if if we get an offer totaling around about 25 million, that would be my starting point. I wouldn't say no to 20 million either. Uh, because I'm realistic about what a player who's played very little football, whose body constantly breaks down and who needs to rebuild his reputation. I'm very fair and I'm very aware of the damage that the last couple of years has had on his value. It doesn't matter what kind of contract we signed him up onto. It doesn't matter that he's the Arsenal number 10. That's the reality of Emil smith Rowe's situation right now. And I feel like if he's not going to play a significant role, which he certainly didn't in the season that's just ended. And if there's no appetite to use him more and there's no belief really within the, the sort of coaching staff that he can go on to kind of make himself a starter again, then cash in. Because if he has another season like the one he's just had or another season where he's on the peripheries, then come the end of that campaign, he's going to be worth even less. And it's about, as I keep saying, knowing when to cash in on some of these players. Let's see what you guys are saying uh, on this. Um, Dr. Ken says, uh, let's get 30 million. I don't think you're going to get 30 million. I don't think you're going to get it. Uh, Chasman Jeffers says, we're too emotional. Move on from him. Um, Afsar says, we'll get maximum 25 million for Emil Smith Rowe. Yes, it's time to let him go. Uh, GSM says, uh, 30 million. There is no player as talented as Emil Smith Rowe whose price should be under 30 million. But we know that prices and values, my friend, are not just based on talent. Um, they are based on availability. They are based on your history in so many different ways. And Emil Smith Rowe's history doesn't really favor him at this moment in time. Um, what else have we got? Khalid says, I'm not letting Emil Smith Rowe go. For me, he's ahead of Vieira. I still think he can do it at the highest level. When he's come on, he's had an impact. And he's unfortunate not to have had a better goal tally. Brian Conlon says, knowing Edu, he'll pay him 10 million to leave. Um, what else have we got? 
Cass says, Emil Smith-Rowe has to move on for the sake of his own career. If he's not going to get enough playing time at Arsenal, then he has to. Hopefully we can get up to 20 million for him as it will be profit. Yeah, of course, look, anything that we earn on Emil Smith-Rowe will go down as pure profit because he is a homegrown player and all the rest of it, which eases some of our PSR concerns. Uh, just before I continue taking some of your comments on this, because there are loads and loads coming through. Guys, could I ask you once again to leave a like on the video if you haven't done so already? Let's get to 200 and 50 likes. There's more than enough of you watching. We're nearly at 500 now. Subscribe to the channel if you're brand spanking new. It really, really does help. And if you're listening on audio, please do leave us a review. Christoph says, Emil Smith-Rowe is worth exactly how much the highest bidder is willing to pay for him. Completely agree. We do not determine the final market value of a player. The market does. You're absolutely right. Marvel uh, says, so how did City sell Palmer for 45 million, even though he played just one start with them because that was a fee that was weighted heavily on the guy's potential. Now in Emil Smith row, yes, potential is a factor and we look at him and he's still only what 23 years of age. He'll be 24 um, come next month. Yeah. Potential is a thing, but potential at 24, if you haven't fulfilled your potential or got close to that by 24, it's very, very different to, you know, being a little bit raw at 20 or 21, which is closer to the stage that Cole Palmer is at in his career. Plus, you have to factor in the fact that Emil Smith-Rowe's body has constantly let him down for a number of years. And if you're worried about how available he's going to be, then of course that impacts his value as well. You can't compare those two, I don't think. Because Emil Smith-Rowe at 21 or at 20 probably would have been talked about in that same bracket as Cole Palmer. But the fact that he's had a couple of years of, of nothing, really, you can't you can't believe that that doesn't have an impact. Of course it does. Of course it does. Um, a lot of you saying and going down the route of, I'd rather keep him than Fabio Vieira. Personally, I don't think any of them are untouchable. And I think that if the right money was to be offered for either one of them, I'd consider taking it. Because I'm not sure that Emil Smith Rowe will ever get back to being the Emil Smith Rowe that we thought he was going to be. And people will say, well, we've seen it in the past. We saw it in a really weak Arsenal team. Can he shine in a very strong Arsenal team? Not saying he can't, but the jury's out on that for me. And for Fabio Vieira, I'm just not sure about him yet. And so if we can even get the £35 million that we're believed to have bought him for, then I think that would be a good move too. Um, and one that I'd certainly consider. Look, sometimes you you make a deal and you realise that it was wrong and the people um, that often come out best are the ones that can recognise when they've got something wrong or when something needs to change and have the, the stomach to make that change uh, rather than just consistently fighting a battle that you're never going to win and consistently sticking with someone who just isn't going to do it for reasons that are unfortunately out of his control. Um, Christian says, tough to admit, but in hindsight should have taken the Villa money for him. Yeah, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but you are um, you are right to make that point, I think. Okay, guys, uh, going to leave it there. So just to summarise on today's show, uh, obviously sending our best uh, to the amazing Mr. Kevin Campbell, uh, wishing him a full and speedy recovery. We know he's not uh, very, very well at the moment. So um, sending all my love. Uh, to Kevin and his family. Real Madrid, UEFA Champions League winners for the 15th time. In my opinion, that makes Carlo Ancelotti the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Jakub Kivior is still wanted by AC Milan. Chances of Arsenal, though, in my opinion, making a profit on the Polish international are pretty slim. Uh, Arsenal have, according to some reports, inquired about Mikhail Fai, uh, the £17 million rated Barcelona defender. Following Balogun has had a bit of a rotten season and um, I think we were more than justified in taking the 30 million euros that we did for him in the summer. And our London rivals, Fulham, are said to be keen on Emil Smith-Rowe. I think that's a decent landing spot for him. And I think if we get 25 million pounds for him, given all these problems and his recent history, I think we'd have done all right. You've been listening to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast with me, Harry Simu. Remember to leave a like if you're watching us on YouTube, to leave us reviews, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any other audio platform, 
Um, subscribers are welcome. If you want to become a Patreon, you can as well. The link is in the description below. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about Benjamin Sesco, who continues to be linked with Arsenal, we haven't spoken about him today, but those links continue to do the rounds, then go and check out our scouting video in which we um, done a bit of a deep dive on Benjamin Sesco. I gave you my thoughts, my opinions. We looked at what the stats say, what the numbers say, what the eye test tells us to, and um, came to a conclusion on whether or not he'd be the right fit for Arsenal. Do check that out as well. Until the next time, I'll see you all very soon. Enjoy your Sunday. Enjoy the sunshine. All the best. I'll be Arsenal. Goodbye.